Unraveling COVID-19 Introduction On 31 December 2019, the Chinese authorities reported to the World Health Organization an emerging novel coronavirus in patients from Wuhan, Hubei province. Currently, the virus is known as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 SARS-CoV-2, and the disease name is Coronavirus Disease 2019 COVID-19. This virus has a higher degree of lethality than other endemic viruses, and it is also more lethal to humans compared to the earlier emerging outbreaks of SARS-CoV-1 in 2003 and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus MERS-CoV in 2012. Both SARS-CoV-1 and MERS-CoV have common ancestry with viruses found in bats. Both have intermediate hosts for transmission, palm civets for SARS-CoV-1 and dromedary camels for MERS-CoV. However, there is not yet strong evidence for an intermediate host. The current pandemic is caused by SARS-CoV-2. It shares with the earlier two coronaviruses the features of the coronavirus family. Coronavirus have large 30 kb, single-stranded, positive-sense RNA genomes. The genome is roughly 80% identical with other coronaviruses at a nucleotide level. A virus closely related sharing 90% of nucleotide structure, to SARS-CoV-2 is RAG-13-2013, which was identified in bats. The complete genome of SARS-CoV-2 isolated from Wuhan Hu-1 is available online. Genetic epidemiology of HCOV-19 and submitted data since December 2019 are available from the GISED database. SARS-CoV-2 is composed of at least 11 open, reading frames ORFs, with a full length of 29903 BP. Four major structural protein, coding genes have been identified in the coronaviruses, spike proteins, envelope protein E, membrane protein, and nucleocapsid protein. The spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 utilizes angiotensin-converting enzyme 2-ACE2 as its cell surface receptor, and utilization influences the tropism of the virus. COVID-19 infects people of all ages. However, there are two main groups at a higher risk of developing severe disease, older people, and people with underlying comorbidities such as diabetes mellitus, hypertension, cardiorespiratory disorders, chronic liver diseases and renal failure. Patients with cancer and those receiving immunosuppressive medication, as well as pregnant people are also thought to be at a higher risk of developing severe disease when infected. Pathophysiology. Transmission of infection. The transmission of infection is mainly person to person through respiratory droplets. Fecal oral route is possible. The presence of the virus has been confirmed in sputum, pharyngeal swabs and feces. Vertical transmission of SARS-CoV-2 has been reported and confirmed by positiveness of pharyngeal swab for COVID-19. The median incubation period of COVID-19 is 5.2 days, most patients will develop symptoms in 11.5 to 15.5 days. Therefore, it has been recommended to quarantine those exposed to infection for 14 days. Pathogenesis Mechanisms the SARS-CoV-2 infection enters the host cells through the S spike protein by binding to ACE2 for internalization, and aided by TMPRSS2 protease. The high infectivity of the virus is related to mutations in the receptor binding domain and acquisition of a friend cleavage site in the S spike protein. The virus interaction with ACE2 may downregulate the anti-inflammatory function and heighten angiotensin II effects in predisposed patients. With the challenge we face with COVID-19, some have been advocating for the use or cessation of angiotensin II receptor type 1 at 1 receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors during the treatment of COVID-19 in patients with hypertension. Currently, the recommendation of the Council on Hypertension of the European Society of Cardiology is that patients should continue their antihypertensive treatment with no changes because we do not have evidence supporting its cessation aid. However, further research is needed to back these recommendations with more evidence. The invasion of the virus to the lung cells, myocytes and endothelial cells of the vascular system results in inflammatory changes including DEMA, degeneration and necrotic changes. These changes are mainly related to pro-inflammatory cytokines, including interleukin IL-6, IL-10 and tumor, necrosis factor alpha, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, monocyte chemoattractant protein 1, macrophage inflammatory protein 1 alpha, and increased expression of programmed cell death 1, T-cell immunoglobulin and mucin domain 3 TIM3. These changes contribute to lung injury pathogenesis, hypoxia-related myocyte injury, body immune response, increased damage of myocardial cells, and intestinal and cardiopulmonary changes. 
Infection with SARS-CoV-2 has been also shown to cause hypoxemia. These changes lead to accumulation of oxygen-free radicals, changes in intracellular pH, accumulation of lactic acid, electrolyte changes and further cellular damage, body systems and organs affected. The respiratory system is the primary system affected in SARS-CoV-2, and multiple infiltrates of both lungs may be present. Real-time PCR RT-QPCR, amplification of SARS-CoV-2 virus nucleic acid of nasopharyngeal swabs or sputum is needed to confirm the diagnosis, however, the test may be negative in the early days of presentation. The clinical picture, including shortness of breath, increased respiratory rate, decreased oxygen saturation and raised C-reactive protein, is nonspecific. Other tests, such as Ig and Ig antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, CD4+, and CD8+, should be ordered. Both CD4+, and CD8+, are substantially lowered in SARS-CoV-2. The pathology of the lungs shows microscopic, bilateral diffuse alveolar damages, cellular fibromyxoid infiltrates and interstitial mononuclear inflammatory infiltrates with lymphocyte domination. The cardiovascular system is usually involved in COVID-19 infection. Biomarkers such as elevated highly sensitive troponint, natriuretic peptides and IL-6 are prognostic, and their progressive rise is associated with poor outcomes. The inflammation of the vascular system results in the following changes, diffuse microangiopathic thrombi, inflammation of cardiac muscle myocarditis, and cardiac arrhythmias, heart failure and acute coronary syndrome. These cardiovascular complications may cause death. The lymphocytopenia observed during the infection potentially involves CD4 plus and some CD8 plus T cells. These changes disturb the innate and acquired immune responses, causing delayed virus clearance, and hyperstimulated macrophages and neutrophils. Notch signaling is known to be a major regulator of cardiovascular function, and it is also implicated in several biological processes, mediating viral infections. Recently it has been debated whether targeting notch signaling can prevent SARS-CoV-2 infection and interfere with the progression of COVID-19-associated heart and lung disease pathogenesis. The reported gastrointestinal manifestations of COVID-19 include diarrhea, nausea, vomiting and abdominal pain. SARS-CoV-2 RNA has been isolated from stool specimens and from swabs that sampled the anus-slash-rectum. ACE2 has been found to be expressed in the epithelial cells of the gastrointestinal tract, suggesting virus entry through the ACE2 receptors and its replication causing inflammatory changes and the patient's symptoms. SARS-CoV-2 also causes liver injury, which manifests as elevated serum, alanine aminotransferase and aspartate aminotransferase levels. Mild elevation of serum bilirubin and gamma glutamyl transferase have also been reported in some patients with COVID-19 infection. In most cases, the liver injury was transient and mild. However, severe liver dysfunction or injury has been reported in patients with severe disease. High levels of alanine aminotransferase of over 7,500 slash L has been reported in a Chinese study. Microscopically, microvesicular stetosis of the liver and mild lobular injury has been found in COVID-19 infected patents. It is not clear whether the observed SARS-CoV-2 associated liver injury is caused by direct viral injury, or if it is related to hepatoxic drugs, coexisting systemic inflammatory changes, sepsis, respiratory distress syndrome induced hypoxia or multiple organ failure, there is clinical evidence that the SARS-CoV-2 has potential neuropathic properties. Several neurologic-related symptoms have been reported, including headaches, dizziness, seizure, decreased level of consciousness, acute homoagic necrotizing encephalopathy, agitation and confusion, patients with comorbidities. In patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus, who are infected with COVID-19, it is important to remember that two receptor proteins, ACE2 and depeptidyl peptidase 4, are established in the pathogenesis of COVID-19 infection. These two receptors are also transducers involved in normal physiological processes, including metabolic signals regulating glucose homeostasis, renal and cardiovascular physiology, and pathways regulating inflammation, history and physical examination. History and physical examination are extremely important for the diagnosis of COVID-19 infection. 
Common related symptoms are, fever in 44% of patients on presentation and up to 88% of admitted patients, dry cough, shortness of breath, which may be severe and progressive, particularly when the patient develops pneumonia, myalgia and tiredness, sore throat, and nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. Patients may have neurologically related symptoms, including, acute cerebrovascular disease, headaches, dizziness, seizure, decreased level of consciousness, encephalopathy and agitation and confusion 40 recently, Anosmia, hyposmia and biscusa have been reported 21 physical signs include raised body temperature, increased respiratory rate, decreased oxygen saturation, auscultation of the lungs may be normal or show crackles and signs of heart failure, cardiac arrhythmias, myocarditis, acute coronary syndrome, shock and death may occur, evaluation. In patients with clinical evidence of COVID-19 infection, laboratory tests may reveal lymphocytopenia, thrombocytopenia, elevated liver transaminases, elevated C-reactive protein and erythrocyte sedimentation rate, elevated serum lactate dehydrogenase, and decreased or normal serum albumin. Elevated serum troponin may be present, indicating myocardial injury. The following tests are used in patients with symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 infection. Viral testing. Viral testing is performed by the RT-QPCR test, used for qualitative detection of the nucleic acid for SARS-CoV-2. Swabs are usually taken from nasal, nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal, sputum or lower respiratory tract aspirates or wash. Positive tests indicate the presence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA, and together with the clinical picture support the diagnosis. Negative test results do not preclude SARS-CoV-2 infection, and shall be interpreted in light of the clinical picture and epidemiologic information. Serology. Serology testing for SARS-CoV-2 is now available. The test can assess prior exposure to virus and cannot be used in the diagnosis of current infection. Cross-reactivity with other human polynovruses may occur. The serology test is particularly useful, one when the viral test is not available. Using the serology test together with the clinical picture could guide in decision making. 2. Patients with late disease complications and their physicians need to make immediate decisions the viral test takes more time to get the results. 3. In some patients, virus shedding is reduced, making RT-QPCR results falsely negative. The serology test can detect IgM and IgG antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 in serum, plasma and whole blood. Rapid antigen testing. Rapid antigen testing is a monoclonal antibody test against the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein. This protein is abnormally expressed in infected cells. Monoclonal antibodies are specifically directed against nucleocapsid protein, and by using enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, it is possible to detect SARS-CoV-2. The test has a reported sensitivity of 84.1% and a specificity of 98.5%. No cross-reaction with human and animal colonoviruses in the ASI were reported. There are no reports yet about applying this test to SARS-CoV-2 ultrasonography. Whole body point of care ultrasonography has been provided to COVID-19 patients. Ultrasonography is considered an essential modality to guide treatment in patients with cardiac or respiratory failure. Current recommendations are to extend its use to multisystem and whole body ultrasonography, thoracic, cardiac, abdomen and deep venous thrombosis, chest computed tomographic scan. Earlier studies during the outbreak in China suggested that patients with and without SARS-CoV-2 can be differentiated by chest computed tomographic imaging together with clinical presentation and the presence of pneumonia. The authors propose that radiologic images and clinical features are excellent diagnostic tools for COVID-19. Predictors of severe disease may include high virus load, elevated neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, chest changes or changed extent of lesion on computed tomography, patient age and presence of comorbidities. Older age and neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio are reported to be independent biomarkers for poor clinical outcomes, complications. Age and sex have been shown to affect the severity of complications of COVID-19. The rates of hospitalization and death are less than 0.1% in children, but increase to 10% or more in older patients. Men are more likely to develop severe complications compared to women as a consequence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. 29 patients with cancer and solid organ transplant recipients are at increased risk of severe COVID-19 complications because of their immunosuppressed status. The main complications reported in patients with SARS-CoV-2 may include 
one, cobulopathy, mainly disseminated intravascular coagulation, venous thromboembolism, elevated D-dimer and prolonged prothrombin time, two, laryngeal edema and laryngitis in critically ill patients with COVID-19. 3. Necrotizing pneumonia due to superinfection caused by pantin valentine leukocyte in secreting staphylococcus reus infection. This superinfection is usually fatal. 4. Cardiovascular complications, including acute pericarditis, left ventricular dysfunction, acute myocardial injury associated with increased serum troponin, new or worsening arrhythmias and new or worsening heart failure. 5. Acute respiratory failure. Approximately 5% of COVID-19 patients require admittance to an intensive care unit because they develop severe disease complicated by acute respiratory distress syndrome. 6. Sepsis, septic shock and multiple organ failure. 7. Higher risk of death, particularly in male patients with severe disease, presence of heart injury, and cardiac complications, hyperglycemia and patients receiving high doses of corticosteroids. 8. Ventilation-associated pneumonia in up to 30% of patients requiring intensive mechanical ventilation. 10. Massive pulmonary embolism complicated by acute right-sided heart failure therapeutics. Currently there is no vaccine or specific antiviral therapy for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Management is based on preventive measures and treatment of the symptoms of infected people. The guidelines of the U.S. Centers for Disease, Control and Prevention for Clinicians, regarding investigational therapeutics for patients with COVID-19 updated 25 April 2020, indicates that there are no drugs or therapeutics potentially approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to prevent or treat COVID-19. The current recommendations include infection, prevention as well as control measures and supportive treatment of COVID-19 complications. Because of the rapid spread of SARS-CoV-2, anti-Hib and anti-Hepatitis C virus medications have been tried in patients admitted to the intensive care unit with severe pneumonia. Summary. The COVID-19 pandemic represents the most significant public health crisis humans have faced since the pandemic influenza outbreak of 1918. To date 25 June 2020, over 9 million people have been infected, 48600 have died and over 5 million recovered. The outbreak originated in China, but more significant numbers of infections and deaths are reported from Europe and the United States. SARS-CoV-2 belongs to the beta coronaviruses, which are highly identical to bat coronavirus. The virus uses the ACE2 receptor for cell entry, causing pathophysiologic changes of the respiratory, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal and nervous systems. Human-to-human -human transmission is evident, with a reproduction number ranging from 2.24 to 3.58, indicating higher transmission. Clinical symptoms include fever, cough and shortness of breath. Symptoms related to the gastrointestinal, cardiac and nervous system have also been reported. Patients at a higher risk of infection include the elderly, those with comorbidities and those who are immunocompromised. Currently no specific therapeutics have been competent to prevent or treat COVID-19. Several drugs have been tried, including antimalarials, antiviral agents, immunomodulators and plasma neutralizing antibody transfusion. These therapeutics are currently being investigated in clinical trials.